Welcome, and in this video course, we are looking at the CyberOps Associate version one course. This course is going to cover the skills and knowledge needed for successfully handling the tasks and duties, responsibilities of an associate level security analyst working at a security operations center. The goal of this video series is to help prepare learners for the Cisco 200-201 certification. That's focusing on understanding the Cisco Cybersecurity Operation Fundamentals course, known as CBROPS. Module 10, Network Services. So these are gonna be services that are tied to network infrastructure, things like DHCP, DNS, NATS. We're also then gonna talk about some application services that are very commonly associated with the network level. Things like FTP, uh, other types of file transfer protocols that are not internet based. Could be talking about email and HTTP, HTTP. And we're gonna talk about variations of HTTP as well, so not just HTTP. All right, so let's jump in. Our first one, we have DHCP or Dynamic Host Control Protocol. Remember that DHCP is one of two ways to obtain an, an address. DHCP is the dynamic option, meaning it will be granted to you at a least time, and there is a very specific structure with that. And with DHCP, we are talking predominantly IPv4. There is an IPv6 variation, but that's outside the scope of the normal view. If you do not want to get an address automatically or dynamically, we can also have dy uh, dynamic addresses that are set aside that could be used as static addresses. So a dynamic address is one that can be modified or changed. If we want to move away from them, we can have a static address, and that is one that will be manually configured on each device, whether it be a host, whether it be a phone, whether it be a printer or a server, they will be static addresses. Basically, when the host connects to a network, how do they get an address? One of two main ways, dynamically or statically. If you configure them statically, you would connect automatically because you already have the address information. If you have a dynamic address, when you connect, you would have a process to obtain a IP address. And that process is called DORA, D-O-R-A. Or it's also known as Discover, Offer, Request, Acknowledgement. So let's assume we have a laptop, it comes on online, it doesn't have an address, it's going to reach out with a broadcast to everyone on the network trying to find the DHCP server. That's going to be the DHCP discovery. It's going to say, hey, I need an address. The server will respond with an offer and that will be a unicast message back to that DHCP client. And basically this will be an offer for the lease the client will then request the same information and it will identify the explicit server that will be leasing the offer as well as the address the client will be accepting and again that will be sent via broadcast. The recipient uh, DHCP server will then return the message via a acknowledgement. Basically as long as the client sends accepts the offer and then sends a request and the address is still available, the server will acknowledge the message and actually grant the address. If the address is no longer available, then the DHCP will send a NAC instead, a N-A-K. Basically that is a no acknowledgement and the process will start over again. If the address is available, it will get a DHCP ACK, a C K or acknowledgements. Oftentimes when this process is going through, you end up with a address for a least period of time. The least period 
is going to be a period that the server grants you access to that address for a given amount of time. By default, it is eight days, but it can be modified depending on the criteria of the network. So there is some structure to DHCP. For example, in the fields in a DHCP message, we have things like an operational code or hardware type, a hop, source and destination addresses, uh, if there's any specific DHCP options, some server names, and we have a lab where we're gonna be looking deeper into the messages, but that's a, a brief overview of how we look at the message for a DHCP response. All right, the next main service is DNS. DNS is Domain Name Systems. It provides the domain names and their associated IP address. You go to google.com, for example. In reality, we people know the name. The systems know the IP address. So DNS has to be there in order for us to convert the domain name to an IP address. Again, the devices don't know names. We have to have a translation so the device knows where to send the message. We have a hierarchy. At the very top, we have a root level. It's called root. Underneath uh, our root level, we have the top level domains or TLDs. That's going to be the .net, the .edu, the .com, the .country, the .gov, the .dot the, the mainstream ones. Underneath the top level domain, we'll have the actual domain. So Cisco.com, for example. Underneath .com, we'll have Cisco. Underneath the .com, we'll have Google or Amazon because they all end with the same dot level domain level, which is a dot com. If we had a dot org, dot org should list all of the domains that end with dot org. We have a lookup process. Essentially, we have a client or computer. When you go to a website, that computer, that node, will have to send a query to a local DNS server. Those are typically called a second level domain server. That server, if it doesn't know where uh, that resource is, it may have to ask a higher level server. Essentially, that second level server is going to do what's called a authoritative query type, and that is where they ask the top level domains to find the appropriate address. This is also sometimes referred to as a recursive query. The top level domains should be able to pull the data. If they're not, let's say they have to go to a different zone or a different type of extension, like a, we're in a .com DNS server and we need to go to a .gov DNS server, that's called a different zone. So if we need to access data from a different zone, we'll do a transfer from a authoritative zone to a different zone that has access to where we need. The process of transferring DNS data between the servers is no, uh, known as a zone transfer. So when we're looking at the overall process, we need to understand the query process. We go to a web browser, we type google.com. That's also known as a fully qualified domain name. That will then search for a, a local DNS server or whatever DNS server is configured by the client. That DNS server will look at the fully qualified domain name and will map it to an IP address. The DNS query will respond sent back to the client with the IP address. This is the domain name, this is the IP address, so that we understand what the address is. From there, the DNS server will match the fully qualified domain name and its IP address and will send it back to the client. The client will then take the IP address that has been used 
and then put that in a data a packet and then forward it appropriately with the destination being the now newly discovered IP address that's associated with that domain name. Just like with DHCP, we need to understand the message types. DNS uses UDP port 53 for DNS queries and responses. Again, port 53 using UDP. If a DNS response exceeds a very large 512 bytes, we have a dynamic DNS would be used. That's going to handle all things that are larger in size. The DNS protocol will communicate over a single format. It's called a message. DNS will use the same message format for all types of client queries and responses and transfers and everything. You will notice the section question, the answer section, the authoritative section, and the additional information section will vary in size. From there, we have a DNS fixed header. And then on top of that, we have our eight bytes for our UDP datagram. That will make up the entire message for our lookups. Since they can vary in size, those are the more important. The question should be the question for the server. That will be like the domain name to be resolved. The answer should be the record or the resource record. That should include the resolved IP address. The authoritative should contain the RRs for the domain authority. That's the resource record or the resource record type. And then the additional information is anything relevant to the query response only. And this could also be like the consists of the resource records. It can also hold additional information. It can also look at how to respond more efficiently. But these are going to be the four main sections that will vary in size for the overall DNS response message. So with dynamic DNS or DDNS, this will allow a user or organization to register IP addresses with a domain name as within a DNS server. So we can have like a, a DNS provider that then actually lists all of the mappings and then we can report those back to a, a DNS provided server or any of the subdomains of that server. The subdomain will be mapped to the IP address of the user server or to the home connection based off of the device. Basically, the nice thing here is if we have a device that comes online that might be dynamic in its address assignment, we can do a dynamic DNS attachment to it so that every time it, that device comes online, we get an updated record for that device. That way that device will always have that same domain name and it will just update the IP address of that resource. And that means when there's a change that is detected, the DNS or the DDNS will immediately inform other DNS servers of the change. The DDNS provider service will supply the IP address to the resolver's second level DNS server so that everyone knows of the updated change. Pretty common when we're talking like a non-static IP address for a business that you need to be able to access resources. So instead, they do that so that we can map the domain name instead of the IP address because the IP address changes. We can just map the domain name and have it dynamically update when there are new addresses. So with DNS, we also have the ability to do lookup information based off of the information provided to the registrars. That's known as a who is lookup or a who is protocol. Essentially, any domain name when purchased through a registrar will have to supply certain information. Who owns it? Who are the administrative contacts? Who are the technical contacts? the email address, the phone number, possible email addresses, and all of that is public record. Those are known as who is lookups. The who is can then look up detailed information based off of the registrar's detail. 
For example, if you do a who is look up on Google, you can see current domain information, who's the primary contact, who's the technical contact, who is the support contact, phone number and email address for those contacts as well. Who is is basically the starting point for identifying potentially dangerous internet locations that can be reached. Realistically, you can also map protections based off of unknown who is, or if you're trying to do some reconnaissance, you can look at your victims or your target's website to see who manages their website and that get, could possibly lead you with information that can be used to better target them. For example, if you are targeting a school, a who is lookup against that school's domain, you can get the email address and the administrative contact and the technical contact so you can spoof their email addresses and pretend to be them and contact the school. That's one avenue. Remember that the Lookups are internet based and they are based off of the domain name. We have a lab exploring UDP DNS captures in Wireshark. Remember the labs are outside of the content of this video and they'll be posted as separate videos. Moving on, we have our NAT or network address translation. This allows us to take a private address base and map it to a public address whether we're doing it for based off of a pool of addresses or an individual port is going to be based off of that whatever technology is being implemented the goal here was to take the exhaustion of ipv4 public addresses and to kind of help mitigate that by allowing several private ip addresses to be hidden or masked behind one public ip address in a home router, for example, your home router will have one public IP address and everything on your home network will be masked to that one single IP address, thus alleviating the need for dozens of public addresses per individual homes. So what is NAT? NAT is used, first of all, to conserve addresses, specifically public IP addresses. You can have a pool of addresses or you can have a single address. It kind of just depends on how you want to set it up. A NAT router will typically operate at the border of a stub network. That's going to be very common, like a home network. And they will be used to mask the private address space. Essentially, what will end up happening is as a packet leaves the network, we will have four types of addresses. An inside local, and that will be the actual IP address of the end user trying to communicate. We will have an inside global, and that is going to be whatever address that's going to be being sent out of. We have an outside local, and that is going to be the destination address. And we have an outside global, and that should also be the destination address. If we do not want to do a pool of addresses, we can do what's called PAT, Port Address Translation, or NAT Overload. Essentially, what ends up happening is all the devices that will leave a stub network will going out of one port will be masked with one IP address, but they'll be differ, uh, differentiated between different port numbers as the source port. You go to Google, you're going to port 80 or port 443. That's the destination port. The source port can be used to identify individual streams of communication. And with port address translation, that's what happens. PAT will ensure that each device will have a separate stream of communication identified with a different TCP-based TCP port number. And that will be unique based off of the source information. 
and that will be used on the inside source address to distinguish between the different translations. Now let's look at different types of file transfers, not just file transfer protocol, FTP, but other forms as well. So how do we get data between one device and another? That's one of the big things we have to discuss. So if we're doing a uh, network-based or a internet-based, they're going to be slightly different. Between one device and another uh, device, if they're on separate networks, a common way would be File Transfer Protocol, or FTP. This allows us to uh, transfer files via a server to a client. The FTP client will run on a local computer and it will pull data from the FTP server. FTP allows for two connections, a control connection and a data connection. The control connection will basically, the client will open and the first connection to the server for control traffic. And then after that, it will pull down via a data connection. The client will open the second connection for data traffic. Well, that's one of the more common types, but if you need a less overhead, something you use for smaller traffic or smaller data, we're going to be looking at Trivial or TFTP. TFTP is much more simplified and it will use the well-known UDP port 69 as opposed to FTP, which will use port 20 and 21. So FTP and Trivial FTP pretty much do the same thing, but Trivial FTP is used for smaller groups of data, where FTP is used for much larger. Now, there are secure versions of both of these. Uh, secure FTP, or Secure Copy Protocol, SCP, or TFTP over SSL. So, I mean, there are some variations for securing these protocols, but for now, we're just discussing the base protocol and their negative functions. So TFTP and FTP, oftentimes everything is clear text, so do keep that in mind. Other protocols might be like SMB or server message block. This is also a client server sharing protocol, typically not done over the internet, however. SMB is going to be a same network or a very close network. Again, it's a client server file sharing protocol that typically uh, within Windows, it does request a response. So the server can make their own resource available to clients on a local network. For example, in a Windows environment, sharing a printer or sharing a file can be done on the server and then clients can then request access to those resources. You can also do things like mail and APIs, but Oftentimes in a Windows environment, it, we're looking at file systems or file shares and printers are the more common ones. SMB messages can start, they can also have the authentication and the termination sessions. They also allow for control files and uh, printer access as well as applications. SMB file sharing and print services have become one of the mainstays in a Microsoft network. Again, file sharing and printer functionality, very common, SMB is going to be the main protocol. You can move uh, files between two devices over a network. That's going to be SMB in a Microsoft network. We have a lab using Wireshark to examine TCP and UDP captures. So we're going to be looking at FTP and we're going to be looking at TFTP. So those were the, the main options. Now we're going to get into some application layer protocols, so things like email, for example. Email protocols are used to store and forward and receive internet traffic, essentially, or internet messages. So the big thing is we have an, a sender and a recipient. We have the sender using some form of client communication to send or receive, or both. Let's say the sender is sending something to recipient at cisco.com, for example. Well, sending the email is going to be using the simple mail transfer protocol, or SMTP, and that uses TCP port 25. It will go through the internet, 
using the SMP protocol. It will get to the mail server. It will go to the original sender's mail server. Let's say it's cisco.com. If it needs to go to a different mail server because you're emailing someone at gmail.com, then the mail server for Cisco will then send it to the mail server for Gmail. That will still be SMTP. Once we get to the destination mail server, we will use one of two main protocols to send it to the recipient. It will either be IMAP or POP3. POP3 is one uh, TCP port 110, IMAP is port 143. And they will be delivering the mail to the recipient one of two ways. There are differences between POP and IMAP. That's way outside the scope uh, for right now. But the big one is SMTV to send, IMAP and POP to receive. So SMTP, again, it's the message uh, format. It looks at the header and the message body. It does use well-known port, TCP port 25. With POP, this is an application and it's used to retrieve mail from a mail server. This is going to be what's coming down from the mail server for the recipient. This uses TCP port 110 and essentially it will use TCP to connect to the mail server and the mail server will copy down the message. Once the message is downloaded, it will close the connection to the mail server. IMAP is the other method for retrieving mail. With IMAP, the, a user is actually going to be downloading a copy of the message from the mail server, leaving the original message on the server itself. So if you have multiple devices accessing your email, you don't have one machine that pulls down the message and it's no longer accessible by other machines. This will use port 143. So now let's get into the last major section, which is going to be how we send web pages over the internet. This will be using Hypertext Transfer Protocol, or HTTP. Hypertext Transfer Protocol is a hypertext markup language. Basically, we will be given a web URL or a uniform resource locator. URL. That's essentially the domain name. You'd have that in a web browser. www.google.com. That will be the URL. If you want to be more specific, if you type https colon slash slash www.google.com, the https colon slash slash is the protocol. But the entire string https colon slashes www.google.com that is the url the browser has to look at the entire url it has to interpret all three sections of the url and that is going to be first the protocol then the server name or subdomain for the example i just verbally said google.com or www.google.com that would be the server name www would be the subdomain. Here in this example, they're using cisco.com. www is still the subdomain of cisco.com. Then we have the file we're trying to retrieve, index.html. That is a specific file being requested. So I'm actually going to grab my pen. So when we are looking at this, after the .com, we have a forward slash that starts showing the directory structure of the web server. This file.html is sitting in the root directory of that web server. Step two, once you hit enter, for example, you will be sending an HTTP GET request. GET is going to be used to retrieve the file being asked for. In the response to the request, the server will send the HTML code for the website trying to be browsed. You may get a HTTP code 200, which is an acceptable, we're going to deliver it. 
Well, in reality, this happens so quickly, the end user normally doesn't see this. They will get a web page instead. There are other HTTP codes out there like 404. 404 is when a web resource can't be located, so they give you a 404 page. That is just a HTTP code that says resource not able to be found. So step four, step three and four kind of go hand in hand. They go fairly quick. Step three, you get the, the 200 okay. Step four, you actually get the website retrieval. And again, this will happen within milliseconds often. So now let's look at the HTTP code itself. Here we have a longer HTTP. So first of all, we already know at the beginning part is the schema or protocol. Then we have the domain and the extension, the extension being .com. Sometimes you may also see a port number colon with two numbers or colon with a, a string of numbers that's going to be the port the colon denotes the port the first slash shows you the path so the path is actually in the directory sounds and then we get a question mark the question mark itself is the beginning of a query and we're looking for something. So a fragment is also then preceded by a pound sign. So if you see a pound sign, that's part of a fragment. And basically this refers to a subordinate part of the resource when we're looking at this. The big thing is understand the protocol, the domain, the ports, the path, and that question mark. The question mark is pretty big. And this at least allows us to break down the structure of a URL. So we said we get a HTTP GET request when we open up a web portal. Well, there's more than just a single request that we have options for. We have a POST or a PUT or a DELETE, a CONNECT options. If we are requesting something that's GET, if we're trying to post material or trying to put material on a website, that's going to be post and put depending on the circumstances. So there are other options when we're looking at HTTP. Git is the most common as we are retrieving content. We also have the status codes. Uh, I was giving you 404 error, for example, earlier. Four XX, for example, is any type of client error. So a 404 normally is uh, not found. It's 100 or informational. Anything in the 200 range is successful. A 300 is a redirectional. 400 is client error. 500 is server error. Pretty common ones are like 100. That's a, a continuation page. Uh, Again, these are going to happen very quickly. You may not even see them unless you're capturing the data traffic, and then you can review the codes after the fact. With 200, you have an OK or an accept option. 200 being OK, 202 being accepted. Other common ones are, again, the client errors. That's going to be things like 403 or 404. The 404 errors are probably the most common. That's where the server could not find the requested resource, so it doesn't know what to do. So it gives you a not found. If you're trying to access an area that you don't have permission to or you're not authorized to, you get a 403 error. We also have things like HTTP slash two. This is a better performing version of HTTP. HTTP by default is the version 1.1. It's an older version of the protocol. With HTTP 2, it uses the same header format as 1.1, and it uses the same status code, but it's actually able to multiplex streams of data so that things can be more efficient. With 1.1, for example, you'd have to have individual streams for each individual data file, an HTML versus a PNG versus a uh, JScript or JS script.
So you have three different connections. With HTTP version two, we have the ability to combine them via multiplexing. Few important features that are kind of important is understanding the multiplexing, the server push, the binary protocols, and header compression. Reality, we're gonna be looking at this in much uh, greater detail in our lab, but the big one here is multiplexing, understanding that we can have one packet or one string that actually has all three files we're res uh, trying to access, as opposed to three individual sessions to get three files. We can have one request versus three. So how do we secure HTTP? We secure it using HTTPS or HTTP secure. Oftentimes it's written HTTP over SSL. In reality, the S just means secure and it's kind of secure different methods. HTTPS will use authentication and encryption to secure the data. It can also be the same as a client request server response that you'll find in HTTP but the data stream itself is encrypted using either SSL or TLS. With HTTPS2, this is more specific over HTTPS over TLS. This is going to be an application layer protocol that is going to be using the newest version of TLS for the best security. Uh, remember, and again, it's important that confidential information is only transmitted over HTTPS always. HTTP is not secure. We have a lab examining both HTTP and HTTPS traffic so that we can understand that flow of communication. So that is actually all for this module. We covered basic network services like DHCP, DNS, NAT, NAT overload. We started talking about some file transfer protocols like FTP and TFTP. We looked at some email protocols as well as some web-based protocols, HTTP, HTTPS, and we learned about the different types of status codes and the specific type of request options for HTTP. If you have any questions or concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. If you have any questions or anything, please feel free to reach out. Again, with this material, being able to ask questions and discuss some of the topics in the lecture help build long-term retention, so do not be afraid to communicate with this topic. Again, I'm here if you need anything. Thank you.